Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. That no one having drunk the old wine immediately desires the new, for he says the old is better. People get settled in their ways. The longer someone is churched or religious or involved without making a commitment to Christ, the harder it is to get them to understand you have to have a real relationship with Jesus. Today we have part two of Pastor Sam's message entitled, Who Needs Jesus? We'll be taking up in verse 24 of Luke chapter five as we finish looking at the passages where Jesus heals a paralytic and tells him to take up his bed and go home. Pastor Sam will then take us through the end of chapter five, so let's listen in. But here's what I've learned about the commands of Christ. If he gives me three impossible things to do, all I need to do is the first one. The others are gonna take care of themselves. Once I've obeyed the first impossible command, well, what kind of a po impossible commands does he give me? He tells me to love my enemies. Have you tried that lately? I mean, it's, let's be honest. He says, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Hey, I find that difficult. I love Pam as much as I can, but, but he's talking about loving in such a way that it is sacrificial and unconditional where I always put her first. That's not my nature. I have to be walking in the spirit to do that. And, and the moment I'm in the flesh, I stop doing it. And I misrepresent him, cause some trouble for myself. And, and so the, the idea is he gives us a lot of impossible commands, but, but we have to rely on his power in order to fulfill them. And here's the cool part. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the testimony of scripture. This guy hears Jesus say, arise. And he's like, all right, you say so, I'll do it. And he stands up. And then he says, take your bed and, and go to your house. Now, the crowd is going to part like the Red Sea to let him out. The crowd wouldn't part to let him in. But now you see again the scene. They're going to be like, whoa, check it out. He's going to be rejoicing. They're going to be in awe. So, so his bottom line is what? That you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Arise, take up your bed and go to your house immediately. He rose up before them, took what he'd been lying on, departed to his house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Yeah, nothing like this before. So in the case of the hopeless, he found his way to Jesus in the capes of the helpless. Others gathered together in a unified effort to get this needy brother to Jesus, bearing him as their burden. Well, the next case is in verse 27, our third snapshot. We know this guy as Matthew. The passage here calls him Levi, not unusual at all. In fact, as you go through the scriptures, you'll find Abram becomes Abraham, Sarai becomes Sarah, Jacob becomes Israel. God often changes people's names and he changes their nature and character with it. He gives them a name that reflects who they become so that they don't have to walk around always saying, well, this is who I am or what I am. So there's this tax collector we read. His name's Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up and followed him. Now, Tax collectors today, they're just government employees doing a job. It doesn't make them the most popular people, but I do want to say if you're a tax collector, you work for the IRS, hey, you're welcome and we're glad you're studying and, and, and we really aren't that, well, no, we, we really don't like what you do, but we still like you. And the bottom line is, well, tax collectors today are not going to be the most popular guy on the block. I mean, that's just the way it is. But tax collectors in that day, they were considered to be traitors and criminals. Traitors because, well, the Romans were pretty smart when it came to taxes. They didn't want to get involved with collecting taxes from the people they were oppressing and dominating. So they would let you bid to collect taxes from your people and give it to them. Anything you collected above and beyond what they required was yours to keep. So in order to be a tax collector, you had to choose to work for the Romans. And then, well, they didn't pay all that well. 
So lots of tax collectors, well, they were just notorious for being cheats, for being dishonest, for, for lining their own pockets. There were lots of wealthy tax collectors. And, and we're going to see that, that in the same way a leper was isolated because of his leprosy, in the same way the paralytic would have been isolated because, well, he couldn't go anywhere. People had to come see him. Well, tax collectors, well, they were isolated as well. They lived in real nice houses. They had, well, they had lots of friends who were tax collectors as well. That's pretty much the deal. And then they did have the best friends money could buy. The, the Pharisees are going to call those people sinners. It's interesting when the religious leaders, they look and they think he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. They weren't saying the tax collectors weren't sinners. What they're saying is the people that would hang out with tax collectors are worse than the tax collectors. That, that, that's the mindset. So, so here's Jesus. He calls calls Levi to follow him. He immediately leaves his tax tables. He leaves behind, just like Peter and, and, and James and John and those had. He leaves all. He rose up and he followed him. I can't help but picture Peter and the guy saying, I can't believe it. He picked a tax collector. And the tax collector is probably thinking, oh my gosh, what's that smell? Fisherman, you know? And, and, and so it's like Jesus is putting together his team. Later, he's going to add, well, he's going to put together the most unusual team. We're going to see it in, in, in one of our next studies. So I won't even go there for now. Well, here's Levi. And now he's, well, no longer collecting taxes. Now he's working for Jesus. The very first thing he does, verse 29, Levi gave him a feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. And the scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Here's a tip if you're a young Christian or you give your life to the Lord today. Make sure as soon as you can, as quickly as you can, invite all your friends over and get some mature believers to come over and share Jesus with them. Why? Because this is your opportunity. They won't be around for very long. They just won't. I mean, your friends one at a time will just either come to the Lord and hang with you or they will just, well, shy away. And he does it day one. He's like, hey, let's have a party. I'm going to invite everyone over. You're my guest of honor, Lord. So, so while one guy comes to Jesus and others are brought to Jesus, this guy does what he can do. He invites all his friends, the tax collectors, the, the notorious sinners, and they get together and they're all in there with Jesus. And the religious leaders can't believe it. I mean, it was one thing for him to hang with them. They're checking him out. But now he's hanging out with these people, those people. Jesus' response, it's actually caused some confusion, mostly in the minds of those who have preconceived ideas and are trying to, well, establish those or, or you know, say, well, this has to be true. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Well, why has that caused confusion? Well, from, from when I was in school, I think this is when the problem began, um, they decided that, that, well, they didn't want to call sin, sin. When I was in school, the Ten Commandments were still on the wall, by the way. It said, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, you know, you're not to lie. And those things, they were there. And, and so, but, but the thing was, is they didn't want to call it what God called it because that might damage our sensitive little psyches. And, and, you know, we might feel bad about ourselves. So they began to substitute words for sin. We call that a euphemism today. And I had an aunt, I think I've shared this with some of you. She was a kleptomaniac. Now, I was really young and, and my, my parents said, oh, we got to be careful. Hide the good stuff. You know, the Aunt Sue's coming over. Oh, I, I'm not going to tell you which one, but too late. Um, but, but anyway, you know, she's coming over and, and, and you know, and, and I'm like, well, why are you hiding that stuff? And they're like, she's a kleptomaniac. Now, I'm a, a young kid and I'm thinking, a maniac, awesome, you know, but... <laughs> But I'm like, what's a kleptomaniac? And they're like, oh, that's a person who, who takes stuff because they have a disease. And I'm thinking and I'm trying to put it together. And, and all of a sudden the light goes on. I mean, you mean she's a thief? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. She has a disease. Well, guess what? There's no disease of kleptomania. And, 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 and here's how crazy we are as a society. We have taken stealing and called it kleptomania. And then we've decided, no, Kleptomania, that, that, that has implications in and of itself. Well, now we have euphemisms for our euphemisms. Now people are ethically challenged. Don't you love that? They're not thieves. 
They're not kleptomaniacs. They're ethically challenged. If you want to see a group of ethically challenged people, watch C-SPAN sometime, our Congress. Hey, these people are ethically challenged. But the bottom line is, unless we'll call sin, sin. And I know you've heard this before, and you'll hear it again. Unless we call sin what God calls it, we'll never find forgiveness of it. Why? He doesn't say if you confess your sickness or if you confess your disease. He says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And, and, and listen, it's in the passage when people pull from the Bible to prove their pet idea or concept, they'll pull a verse or they'll pull a phrase. So it says those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, well, this from the mouth of the great physician. So they're saying, see, see, people have, they have these, these needs. They, they, they're, they're sick. But he says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's not saying tax collecting is sin, but being dishonest as a tax collector is. He, he's, there's really anything that, that, that men could say, well, I can't help this. I, I, I'm not in control of it. Well, who is? And God's saying we are in control of the decisions we make and the things we do. If we're a slave to sin, well, then ask for freedom. And once you're free, don't go back. But he says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, here's the crazy part about this. These guys were scholars. They were students. They studied the law. They knew the law. I'm talking about the religious leaders who were gathered around and who were troubled by the fact that he was eating with tax collectors and sinners. They knew. Isaiah says there are none righteous. No, not one. And they knew it. But they thought they were righteous. Somehow they read that and they think there are none righteous, no, not one. And they think that means everyone but us. No, it means everyone. And so he, he's really doing the same thing he did just a moment ago. As, as they were saying and getting so close to who they were dealing with. Only God can forgive sin. Exactly. And here he is. God in your midst forgiving sin. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. What he's saying here and, and what they should be seeing. I've, I've not come to call the righteous. Now, there's only two kinds of righteousness. There's an imaginary righteousness that men obtain by doing things and not doing other things. You know, they keep the law or try to. You ever talk to someone who says, oh, I live by the Ten Commandments. And I'm like, I died by those. And they killed me because I found I could not keep them. And they're like, whoa, you know, so, so you're a lawbreaker? You bet. And, and not willingly and not joyfully. And, and I don't I take no pleasure in, in confessing it. But, but to say that I look at the law and the law kills me because I'm a guilty sinner. The law was meant to show me my sin, not to cleanse me of sin. It's like a mirror. The mirror can say you're dirty, but it can't cleanse you. Only God can cleanse of sin. And, and, and he called sinners to repentance without turning from sin and confessing it as sin. I'll never find forgiveness for my sin. So, so when he says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance, they should have known, but they didn't. They were self-righteous. They had this imaginary righteousness that kept them from him. Now, the other sinners, the tax collectors, the, the, the notorious sinners, well, they were like, hey, we're guilty, you know. Did all the tax collectors come to the Lord? No, they didn't. But there's some interesting things. Later in our study of Luke, we'll read about another tax collector in the city of Jericho. Jesus comes to town. The guy's um, vertically challenged. If we're going to stick with our uh, uh, politically correct uh, you know, language today, he's vertically challenged. So he climbs a tree so he can see Jesus. And Jesus walks by. He sees the guy up the tree and says, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to feast at your house today. And so they go to his house and he invites all his friends. It's a very similar story, except Zacchaeus has a couple things to say. I just got to draw your attention to it. We'll look at it in detail when we get there. And it's, it's a few months out. So anyway, when he gets to the house, he, he begins to, to say, well, I'm going to make this right. You, you know, I'm going to give half of all I have to the poor. Why? Well, he'd stolen that money and he knew it. And, and then he's like, and, and then he says this, and I love this. If I've, you know, taken anything unlawfully, well, I'll restore that to fourfold. If are you kidding? If? Of course you have. That's why you're, you're, you're even saying it. And, and the idea is sinners know they're sinners. The only people who seem to struggle with this idea are religious people. I don't mean you necessarily. I mean, I hope I don't mean you. 
because there's such a difference in being a religious person and being a righteous person. A religious person almost inevitably becomes self-righteous and legalistic, begins to compare themselves with others, and you, you can't help but have it happen. Why? Because you don't have a true righteousness that lets you rest in Jesus and what he's done. And so you're always trying to, to make yourself feel or look or seem more spiritual than you are. When you're truly righteous, you recognize all of that is a gift of God. All my righteousness is in Christ Jesus. And all that I do is, is just in response to him. It doesn't make me more righteous. It's just a demonstration that I have the righteousness of Christ and, and that I want to be pleasing to him and fruitful for him. Well, tax collectors looked bad to everyone. Scribes and Pharisees look good to most, but none look good to God. So they ask a question, and we will see this again and again and again. In other words, Jesus is kind of getting close to the heart of what's going on and what's gone wrong. And he's saying, I've come to call sinners to repentance. And they're like, well, okay. And, but, but what about this, Lord? They said, well, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those are the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Now, before we look at his response, let me just share one thing about discipleship, because there's something to this whole being a disciple. That's what we're charged with the responsibility of making, not converts, disciples. Of course, conversion is the beginning of discipleship, but a disciple is someone who is following after another, who is imitating and emulating that person. And in the process, if things are going right, they become more like the one they're following. John's disciples were like John. If you don't know about him, well, he lived in the wilderness. He wore strange clothes. He, el he ate like well, locusts and, and weird stuff, you know? And, and so he, he's, he's all into fasting and he's all into depriving himself of just, you know, common creature comfort. So if you're a disciple of John, you're roughing it, you know? You're backpacking. But, but if you're a disciple of Jesus... Hey, Jesus is hanging out with people. I mean, his first miracle takes place at a wedding where he and all of his disciples are guests. And so he's hanging out and, and he's fellowshipping and he's feasting. And, and so his disciples are going to be like him. And so what these guys are doing is saying, well, we see what John's guys do and we see what your guys do. Well, what's, you know, what's wrong with your guys? Like there's something wrong with them. And, and so he says to them in answer, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? Verse 34. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast in those days. What Jesus does in likening himself to the bridegroom is, is he says in, in essence is, hey, while I'm hanging here, while I'm walking, while I'm in your midst, it's like a wedding feast. And, and who who's going to a wedding to celebrate with their friends would say, well, oh, sorry, I can't have anything. I, I'm fasting. No, if you're going to fast, you fast before or you fast after. But you come to the feast to feast. You celebrate with those who are celebrating. And he's saying it's not time for that. These are my, my, my people and, and I'm the bridegroom and, and they're the friends of the bridegroom. And it's not time for fasting. But he says the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast in those days. It is a veiled reference, but a reference nonetheless to his suffering and cross. Why would they fast? Oh, listen, not to, to act spiritual or, or to try to, to be spiritual even. They would fast out of grief as they saw him brutalized and crucified and dead and buried. They'd be fasting because there's no appetite after seeing your Lord go through all of that and thinking it's over. We had hoped that he was the Messiah, but now our hope is shattered. The day would come when they would fast. And that day was, well, approaching. Verse 36, he spoke a parable to him. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new doesn't match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. The wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one having drunk the old wine immediately desires the new, for he says, the old is better. We saw hope for the hopeless and help for the helpless and wholeness for the hated as Jesus gives family to these who are outcast and, and now honesty for the haughty. 
And, and what he's doing is, is he is drawing a couple parallels. And by the way, he uses illustrations that in that day required no explanation. We don't do a lot of sewing, and I don't mean just us guys who are older. I know some of you may sew, but fewer and fewer people do. Why? Clothes are disposable today. It's just the way it is. In those days, you only had a couple garments. And so if you got a tear, that was an issue. So you would patch it. When I was a kid, my mom, and she'd get the patches and iron them on my knees. I was so embarrassed. I don't want to go to school that way, you know. Then we'd cut them off and, you know, not just the patches, just cut off the whole legs. But, but that's its own issue, and I've gotten over it. But um, clearly, I mean, I, I never think about it. And, uh, <laughs> but the deal is they would patch clothes, and everybody knew in that day if you took a new piece of cloth and you sewed it onto a hole where you had older cloth when you washed it the new cloth was going to shrink and it would pull away and it would tear the garment everybody knew that he's trying to draw from from the what they knew to what they don't from what was commonly understood to what few were getting and, and so he's going from the natural to the supernatural the physical to the spiritual he uses a second illustration and, and they uh, were all aware of this they would put wine and in, in wine skins if the wine was new the wine skin had to be new why because as the wine fermented it would release gases and the the wine skin would expand in a new wine skin well it was flexible it was pliable it could do just that and, and what he's doing is he's saying you can't put new wine in old wine skins because well when the the fermentation takes place when when those gases are released that that well the wine skin's going to burst you've destroyed the wine skin and that the wine's been spilled well, what's he talking about? What's the spiritual significance? It's, well, the old garment and the old wine both speak of the old covenant. That's what these guys were into. That's what they were living under. It was all about the law and it was all about their responsibility and their works and their imagined righteousness as a basis or, you know, or a result of all those things. The new garment, the new wine, it speaks of the new covenant established in his blood. The old covenant about law it's blessings conditional the new covenant it's about love and grace it's blessings unconditional the old was meant to provide conviction the new cleansing and forgiveness and restoration and he says it no one having drunk the old wine immediately desires the new for he says the old is better people get settled in their ways the longer someone is churched or religious or involved Without making a commitment to Christ, the harder it is to get them to understand you have to have a real relationship with Jesus. Or you go from this imagined spirituality into a life without him in eternity. So the old wineskins of religion can never hold the new wine of his righteousness received by faith in him. So this is where it leaves us and leads us. For those who fear feel hopeless today there is hope in Jesus and, and, and listen you've come this far now you just need to, to to say it you don't have to say if you're willing you can make me clean he is willing you confess your sin he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness for the helpless listen we together in ones and twos and fours and well we can't together in ones but in twos and fours and such we need to go after those who are alienated from God and we need to pray for them and be witnesses to them and we need to share with them and I know lots of you are doing this if you're feeling like but nothing's happening it's not working something's happening and it is working you just can't see it so you stay the course you keep on keeping on because everyone needs Jesus they need his mercy. They need his forgiveness. For those who were hated and alienated from your own family, and I know for a fact that some of you are, and most of us who have that kind of a, a situation, well, we earned it. You know, we, we broke trust. We, we were dishonest. We were unethical. We, were, we, we sinned in every way, and, and we sinned against our own family. And some of you don't even have a relationship with anyone in your family. There is hope of restoration there, but if you never make it right there, you can have a family here. Jesus' family wants to embrace you. But you have to come and you have to confess your need for him. For the haughty or self-righteous, hey, there's hope, although it's the hardest to break through that nut. And, and for the holy, the righteous, those of us who know we're right with God and we're in Christ Jesus and he's transforming our lives, hey, here's the bottom line. I need Jesus, you need Jesus, we need Jesus just as much today as we did the day we surrendered our life to him. 
In Jeremiah 32, 27, God himself proclaimed, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And the idea of nothing being impossible for God is repeated again and again throughout Scripture. So who needs Jesus? Well, everyone does, but especially those who need the impossible. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.